from, from the minute I walked in there, it was well planned out. Dr. Tyndall was very brusque and quick. Power dynamic was there, it was obvious. As somebody who's that educated, who has a position at USC. I was intimidated by him. He was as old as my father. These women are among the thousands of students and alumni who are former patients of Dr. George Tyndall. He was the head gynecologist at the University of Southern California for nearly 30 years. He went through this kind of like, gaslighting thing. He would make decisions and tell you what was going to happen very quickly. Didn't know what to say. Um, I trusted him. He was a doctor and he was telling me this is the way that it's done. I was groomed in 10 minutes, you know, to be a victim and to not say anything. While court documents show that the university was warned by decades of student and faculty complaints about Tyndall's abuse, he was allowed to see patients as recently as 2016. Now, more than 750 women have filed lawsuits alleging sexual misconduct by Tyndall. The allegations against him have formed the LAPD's largest sex crimes investigation into a single suspect in the department's history. In June 2019, Tyndall was arrested and charged with more than two dozen felonies. He has pleaded not guilty to these charges. These are the stories of some of the women who survived his alleged abuse. When I first went there, I was, in, I was just in awe. The football games, the whole student life there, I loved it. Shannon first started at USC in 1991. Just a few years after, Tyndall had started working on campus. Her story, just like the other survivors, detailed Tyndall's repetitive abuse and sexually inappropriate behavior. Put my legs up in the stirrups, and I was like, there's no nurse. I was thinking, there's no nurse, there's no nurse. When's the nurse coming in? So I said to him, isn't there supposed to be a nurse in here? And he said, no, no, we don't need a nurse. And I just started to panic in my head because I, I I knew my mother told me there should always be a nurse. And he got really annoyed and he walked out of the room and he came back and a nurse followed him in. And he goes, there, there's a nurse. Are you happy now? And she went and sat in a chair in the corner. She was like almost behind me where she couldn't see what he was doing behind the drape. Then he asked me if I had a boyfriend. And I said, yes. And he said, Oh, he must really love your vagina. He began examining me without a glove on, shoving his, his fingers in and out of me, very hard and, and very fast. And my body just reacted in a sort of a self-defense way. I just started pushing back on the stirrups and away from his touch. And he grabbed my right hip really hard jerked me forward and just holding me to the table while using his fingers in sort of like a hooking motion. He grabbed a speculum and stuck it in there and did a, like a swab really hard and then threw the thing on the table and said, you're done. And there was the desk where you signed in and there was a nurse standing there and I said, I just saw the doctor and that exam wasn't right. Like he said some things to me that were not appropriate and Something, it, something was, it was wrong. And she looked at me very sweetly and she said, honey, you're a very pretty girl and you need to get used to things like this. Shannon says she wasn't aware of any other way to report the incident, aside from telling the nurse she had already spoken to. Several years later, Elizabeth was finishing up her sophomore year at USC when she made an appointment at the Student Health Center on campus. Similar to Shannon's experience, Elizabeth says she was subject to inappropriate touching as well as sexual and controlling comments. I explained to him that the bumps I was concerned about were near my bikini line and I wouldn't need to undress to show him. He insisted that I undress fully, he didn't give me the standard blanket to cover myself with, he started to make reference to a piercing that I had, and he started to play with it under the guise of trying to understand it. He then told me that he wanted to feel inside of me to see if there were any more bumps. I told him I didn't feel anything anywhere else, and he just insisted, and he put his fingers into me in and out multiple times and felt around for it felt like forever. When he examined me, he said between the bumps and my piercing that everybody would know I was a slut 
um, and what kind of girl I was and that I should never tell anybody about them um, or nobody would ever want to be with me. I would never be able to be in a in a romantic relationship. Nobody would want me. And I think he did a really good job with mind control. He made sure that I wouldn't walk out and tell anybody what had just happened. They asked me to make an appointment to come back and get the test results, uh, and I refused. For many survivors, Tyndall was the only gynecologist offered to students at USC, leaving those on the school's health plan without a choice. This was true for Vanessa, who saw him three times while at USC. It was during those appointments that Vanessa says she faced the same kind of inappropriate questioning and underwent an unnecessary procedure. When I think back on my whole time at USC now, like, why was it so hard to be there? And then I have memories that come through, and one of them is this or that appointment with Dr. Tyndall. I didn't quite know if I was reading the situation right, because that's a very normal, that's a very normal thing for trauma survivors to do. So I feel a lot of grief that I wasn't able to enjoy my time there more. I was already a sexual assault survivor. He was very interested in my sex life. He was prying. He wanted to know about positions. He wanted to know about things that really weren't medical. I ended up having a procedure that um, other doctors that I've been to since have told me was not medically necessary. He was very excited to tell me about how the big new thing was an anal pap smear and that I probably should have one. I didn't know what to do. I didn't get any time to think about it. It was an uncomfortable procedure. There wasn't anyone in the room for it. Um, I felt really uncomfortable with the way the whole thing happened. But it was so confusing because of his mannerism that I just was uh, swept along. Daniela was one of Tyndall's most recent patients. She was 19 years old when she saw him in April 2016. The same year, USC was told in a report by outside medical experts that Tyndall appeared to be targeting international students from Asian countries. Daniela says her experience included the same inappropriate touching as well as comments about her race. He was asking me questions that were sexual in nature and relating them to me being Filipina. He had me undress from the waist down and he watched while I did so. It felt very uncomfortable because before we had gone into the exam room, we were in his, in his office and he was talking about how it was the same race as his wife. He said that he was just doing like an exam before the STD test. He put two fingers inside me, ungloved. He looked at me and like grinned and he said, I think we better use some lube. And then he was like, okay, we can do the STD test. And then I got dressed and he watched while I did so. And then told me that I should make an appointment. I didn't. Tyndall first started at USC in 1989. According to court records, Tyndall received his first student complaint in 1990. Complaints from former colleagues and patients continued throughout the late 90s and through the early 2000s. It wasn't until 2016 that USC finally placed Tyndall on leave. In May 2018, the Los Angeles Times broke the news about Tyndall's long history of allegations and widespread abuse. It was the first time many survivors realized they weren't alone. I saw his face and his face just was like cemented in my memory. And then I saw how many women it was. It just, it just crushed me. The fact that it went on allegedly started before I was born and has progressed until I was 19 just like makes me so angry. As the number of former patients with similar stories of abuse began to build, the LAPD launched an investigation of its own. In June 2018, police raided a storage unit belonging to Tyndall. In it, investigators found a trove of homemade pornography, as well as what was believed to be pictures of patients taken during exams. They found a box of pictures of women's genitalia that was labeled 1993. And I live in terror that one of those pictures is me because I don't know if he took a picture of me. I don't know because he was behind a drape. And I don't know that my picture my picture's not in there. And I don't know that that's not going to be the next thing that happens. <laughs> and there's no way that he got away with stuff like that. Except that somebody let him. Who that somebody is, is the big question many want USC to answer. Immediately after the story broke, faculty members circulated an internal petition 
calling on Max Nikias, the president of the university, to step down. In October 2018, the university agreed to pay $215 million to settle a federal lawsuit filed by hundreds of women. The settlement would cover the thousands of women who were patients of Tyndall's. The most important part of the settlement to me is that it implements permanent changes at USC to prevent this from ever happening again. Meanwhile, Daniela, along with hundreds of other women, have filed lawsuits outside of the class action settlement. I'm very angry at USC and I'm very angry that this happened and I need those answers and I'm not gonna stop until I get them. And then we'll talk about settlement. The 29 charges Tyndall was arrested for in June 2019 only represent a tiny fraction of the allegations made by hundreds of women. That's because these charges only represent those within the 10-year statute of limitations. We reached out to Tyndall's legal team for comment. As I'm reflecting on the past three years of my life, I'm seeing how certain emotions and certain ways that I've felt or acted or reacted have been rooted from my experience with that doctor. You have to heal at the pace that works for you. So I'm still trying to heal from that experience and from my own response to it. The positive that's come out of it is that healing. I needed to see that there were other women who'd come forward in order to feel comfortable telling my story. There's this great fear because if you come forward, they're gonna claim that it's your fault. They're gonna blame you. They're going to tear your life apart. You're going to have to testify. And so sometimes it just, it's just easier to be quiet. And just, it's just easier to just, just shove it down deep inside. But then I thought about my daughter and I thought I needed to be an example for her and for other women that we're, we're not the ones who should be ashamed and we're not the ones who should hide. Part of the process is having compassion for that girl, for the 20-year-old me who was so shamed that she didn't say anything. That was a really powerful experience to, to find compassion for that girl and to, and to know that he was wrong. I'm not unlovable and I will say something.